Hello. Okay, so uh, we were at little slow, uh, a very fundamental uh, result in queuing theory, uh, which relates uh, the average number of people in a queuing uh, of or customers in a queuing system uh, and the arrival rate, uh, the average arrival rate, and the average time spent in the system. Uh, you know, spent basically waiting for the surface and then the surface itself. Uh, so, um, you know, let's remind ourselves what's going on. So, customer C and uh, I, I, again, like you know, little and slow. Um, you can show it like for special cases, um, but it turns out to be very generic. And for for example, it it does not really uh, require exponential interarrival times or exponential surface times and so on and so forth. So, uh, in the argument uh, that we started last time, you'll find that. There is no mention of you know uh, what exactly the distribution is. It it works for uh, under you know uh, many assumptions, uh, making it like very general and very you know and applicable to many situations. So customer C N arrives at T N, departs at T N D, which is T N plus W. So the customer C N you know so this is the time axis, and customer C N will arrive at this instant of time. Again, customer will arrive and. Uh, there will be some time waiting for the surface, and then there will be surface, and departure will happen at this instant of time, and so this is Wn. Uh, N of t is the number of arrivals on 0 and t. L of t is the number of customers in the system at time t. Note that there are basically two uh, processes going on. There is an arrival process, and then there is a departure process. Once the customers finish uh, their services, I mean, it is assumed that they immediately get out of the system. So you can take an instant of time t and ask, you know, and ask, okay, so how many customers are there in the system at an instant t? Of course, you know, it, you know, it, this will change uh, from t to t. Uh, so, uh, you know, can we write a formula? Yes, we can write a formula in which uh, we express L of t. Uh, as a function that depends on Tn and Tnd. Specifically, we'll have a summation over the natural numbers, n from 1 to infinity, and then an indicator, uh, you know, basically customer n should be counted in L of t if the time n instant t is, you know, between Tn and t, uh, Tnd, between the time of arrival and the time of departure of customer n. Okay, so there is an indicator, and t is between t n and t n d. So uh, basically, uh, by doing this, by having those indicators and summing over them uh, for n from one to infinity, we will count the number of customers, the number of customers uh, who are basically um, uh, in the system at time t. Then, by definition, this is basically the arrival rate. So it is uh, defined to be the limit t tends to infinity n of t over t. Uh, N of T is, is just uh, the arrival, so this is a counting, N of T is a counting process for the arrivals only. And uh, if you divide it by T and then take the limit as T goes to infinity, this by definition will be lambda. And W is, you know, uh, you take, uh, uh, you know, N customers, N customers, and you sum their waiting times in the system, and then you divide by N, uh, and then you ask, you know, if, you know, you, there is a limit as n to goes to infinity, uh, and um, you know this limit, if it exists, it will be w, and l is the average number of uh, uh, customers in the queuing system, and this will be the integral of uh, l of t over time. Okay, so we'll integrate, we'll integrate over time, and then we divide by time. And so these are definitions. Okay, so this is the way those parameters are defined, and the little result I mean, in its most general form is that these three quantities are related to one another specifically you know of course there are no guarantees that those limits will exist but if the limits exist and if they give us finite positive numbers then it must be the case that l is equal to lambda w so the average number of customers in the system is equal to the arrival rate the average arrival rate uh, multiplied by the average time spent in the queue. And it's typically that we are interested in W, so, you know, typically we, we write W as L over lambda. Okay, but, uh, you know, we, we don't even have time, like, to apply littles, littles theorem, and you just try to understand it. Okay, so, uh, what was the strategy? Uh, so, the strategy is basically to, uh, 
you know, to study this thing here, uh, this limit, and, you know, one approach that is typical uh, in complicated situations is to have the sandwich theorem, the squeeze theorem, you uh, upper bound and lower bound the quantity of interest, and then you take the limit, and if uh, the limit of the upper bound and the limit of the lower bound, if both of them converge to the exact same limit, then we are done, and we will say that this quantity itself will go to that limit. And so from uh, basically uh, the last time, I said, well, the strategy should start uh, by taking the integral of L of S dS from 0 to T and try to upper bound and lower bound it. Okay, and so we came up with those our upper and lower bounds. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you remember, the idea was basically to start with this expression and then to integrate uh, from 0 to t uh, and uh, basically to apply to Nelly so that we can interchange the order of integration and summation. So basically, we did some steps uh, that resulted in this being the uh, upper bound and this being the lower bound. Uh, then what you need to do now is to divide by t and then take the limit as t goes to infinity. Okay, so here is, you know, so if we take the upper bound, if we divide by, if we, uh, if we divide by t, okay, so we will get this 1 over t summation, n from 1 to nt of wn, and, um, you know, what we can do is that we can replace this one by n of t, okay, and then we divide by n of t, so that we have, uh, we have a summation with a number of terms, and then we divide exactly by that number of terms. And because N of T is, uh, is basically um, is growing without bound, it converges to infinity uh, almost surely as T grows, uh, then, uh, you know, this N of T, if, if you put an N here, uh, it's the same effect exactly, okay? So because um, limit, uh, so or you can write it that like N of T converges to infinity almost surely as T goes to infinity, uh, then this will actually give us, it's exactly equivalent to this, uh, what we have in the definition. And so uh, this will go to, this will go to W. What about N, N of T over T? Well, by definition, it will be lambda. And uh, again, you know, assuming that both are finite post R, so we, we, we don't need to worry about like uh, one of them being zero and the other being infinity and, and stuff like this. Okay, so uh, under, the, as under this assumption that every limit uh, here exists and is a finite positive number, then yes, the upper bound, the upper bound will converge to the product of lambda and small w. Okay, so uh, so this is this is good, but we are not done yet. Uh, we need actually to show that the lower bound uh, also converges to the same, or we need something uh, actually more specific. Uh, you know, that we need to show that this limit is greater than or equal to lambda w. So, so perhaps we will not be able to show that, uh, you know, once we divide this thing by, by t and then take the limit, perhaps the limit is not, again, is not something that is manageable, uh, but we need to show that this thing is, uh, its limit as t goes to infinity is greater than or equal to lambda w. Because if we show something like this, so if, so if it happens that this limit as t goes to infinity is also greater than lambda w and then the limit on the other side is lambda w then again we will achieve our purpose and we'll show that the quantity of interest which by definition is a small l or you know the average number of customers in the queuing system this will converge to lambda w okay so uh, elena uh, before we continue uh, so uh, suppose that you take Wn, so again remember what's Wn, so this is the waiting time, the waiting time uh, of um, uh, of customer N. So this is the time spent by customer N in the queuing system. Again, you know, this can be, it, it's two components basically, you know, time waiting for the surface and then the time of the surface itself. Uh, what will happen if we divide this quantity by N and then take the limit as N goes to infinity? Uh, so the claim is that this is actually equal to zero. So that, I mean, so if, if we later encounter Wn divided by n and then we are taking the limit, then we can actually put the limit equal to zero. And to show this, I mean, it's, uh, it's um, uh, basically straightforward. Uh, what we do is uh, we, I mean, what is given? I mean, let's, let's use our given information. So our given information is that there is something called W and it is by definition the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n and then summation k from 1 to n of wk. So this is what we know. So we want to express wn as a summation so that we make use of this assumed piece of information. 
and the, the idea is to take Wn and write it as a sum of Wgg from 1 to n. So this will include W1 plus W2 up to Wn, and then but th this is Wn alone, and so we will subtract, you know, those first n um, minus 1 terms. Uh, so we have 1 over n, then the summation g from 1 to n of Wg, well, that by assumption will go to, will go to W. Uh, then we have a summation uh, with, uh, with 1 over n, and then, you know, uh, basically there is 1 n here, and then there is n minus 1 here again, we can just multiply and divide by n minus 1, so that this thing here, uh, we have matching between the uh, number of terms in the summation and the factor that we are dividing by, so this also will give us W, uh, and then there is an extra factor, but happily, uh, basically this extra factor is the limit as n goes to infinity of n minus 1 over n. That's 1. So uh, this guy will go to w, this guy will go to 1, this guy will go to w, so basically, uh, the, you know, this quantity will go to 0 as n goes to infinity. Another thing that will be needed for uh, future purposes is what if we take wn and divide it by tn? So, uh, so remember what is going on is that uh, Tn is the time of arrival of customer n, the nth customer. And then Wn is the time basically spent by the customer in the queuing system. And this will give us Tn plus Wn, which is Tn of D. So what we are saying is that this time here divided by Tn as n goes to infinity. So if we are talking about, you know, uh, you know index n being very, very large, uh, this quantity should basically be arbitrarily small. Will, which means that the limit is exactly equal to zero. Uh, so how can we show how can we show something like this? So uh, by definition, n of t over t is uh, goes to lambda. Again, lambda by definition is defined to be the limit as t goes to infinity of n of t over t. Again, when you have those limit statements, you can replace the parameter t everywhere by something. But this thing. It should also go to infinity as as t go uh, as t goes to infinity. Okay, and so uh, and so uh, n of t n of t n, you know, you can come to this uh, n of t over t n replace t uh, here and there by t n, and this will also be a correct limit statement. So n of t n over t n will go to lambda as uh, as n goes to infinity, and the reason for this is that t n is you know it's the time of the arrival of the uh, of the nth uh, customer and as n goes to infinity this time gets a lot greater and greater and greater okay um now we have uh, this inequality that n of tn so then so tn is, is the time of arrival of the nth customer so if you measure at that time the number of the number of customers in your system what do you expect to to happen you to see so n of tn versus n. So again, we have n of tn. So again, by n of t is a counter. It's a counting process. It counts the number of arrivals from 0 to t inclusive. So t, you know, so if, if there is an arrival at t, you will basically include it in your counting. Now, n of tn, it means that we measure the number of arrivals at the time instant at which customer n the nth customer arrives, arrives, and in that case, you know, you should get n customers, you should get n, or perhaps you can get more, okay, so, you know, so this is typically, I mean, typically it is n, but this can be uh, greater than or equal to n if we allow batch arrivals. I mean, so, so typically, like, when we studied, like, Poisson pro, uh, the Poisson process and the um, renewal processes and so on, it's like every arrival, every arrival is assumed to be, like, unique. So, so basically, uh, if you take an infinitesimal interval of time, you know, the probability of getting more than one arrival, you know, basically shrinks. It's, it's very small. As, as you shrink the time interval, the probability of getting more than one arrival becomes smaller and smaller. But there are models, you know, we have not dealt with them, in which you can allow multiple arrivals at the same time instant. Okay, and so, uh, again, we, we haven't said something like this, but it is there. And uh, we will, you know, if that is the case, then at the time, you know, at the time of, our, of arrival of the nth customer, perhaps the total number of arrivals 
uh, is uh, is basically um, the total is greater than m, greater than or equal to m. Again, because perhaps uh, we have at uh, at some instance of time, uh, basically we have multiple arrivals, two arrivals, three arrivals, and so on. So uh, the idea of using of using the the inequality rather than using uh, that n of t n uh, is equal to n. You know, so so basically, if I, if I didn't like continue and I asked you, perhaps this is what you will say: n of t n is. I mean, this is a count, counting of the number of arrivals up to the time of arrival of the nth customer. So n of t n is n. Okay, again, this is true uh, given what we have been doing in this course. But there are again models uh, that are used, uh, you know, in uh, in random processes uh, that allow uh, you know allow basically uh, batch batches to arrive at the exact same time instant and so i use the inequality here to highlight the fact that uh, little slow uh, is very general okay so it, it goes beyond the typical assumptions that we uh, that we do like like in this course okay so it is very powerful uh, so n of tn is greater than or equal to n and uh, and basically this means that if you divide both sides by Tn, so this by Tn, this by Tn, then this is an upper bound on that. Okay, so uh, remember what is the goal. The goal in the lemma is to show that if you take Wn and you divide it by Tn, then this quantity should go to zero as n goes to infinity. And hence, what you do is that you take Wn over Tn, okay, and then you write it in this, you know, as a product of two terms. One of them is Wn over n, and remember we ha we have shown that basically this converges to zero as n goes to infinity, and then the other term is the other term is n over n over Tn. Now n over Tn is our bounded by n of Tn over Tn. So, uh, which is basically this idea we talked about. Uh, so Wn over n, uh, the first part of the lemma tells us that this will go to zero, uh, n of Tn over Tn this will go to lambda, which is a finite positive number, and so zero times the finite positive number is zero, and so this limit is equal, equal to zero. And what is the meaning that the limit is equal to zero? If the limit is equal to zero, this means that for every epsilon greater than zero, you can find n zero, such that for every small n greater than or equal to n zero, you know, this quantity here can be made less than epsilon. So, I mean, limit equals zero, uh, you have a non-negative quantity and the limit is equal to zero, it means that this quantity can be made arbitrarily small. So it challenged me with any epsilon and I can always find an index n0 such that for every n greater than or equal to n0, this quantity is less than epsilon, no matter, no matter how small epsilon is. So, uh, so there is an instant of time n greater than or equal to zero, again, such that, you know, here you find that Wn is over Tn is, is less than uh, epsilon, which means that Wn is less than epsilon Tn. Now, uh, when n is greater than or equal to zero, uh, basically, uh, and again, like, because this limit is true, then we are guaranteed to be able to find this n0 such that this is always true. Now, add Tn to both sides. So on one side, we'll have Tn plus Wn. The other side, it will be Tn plus epsilon Tn. So that's one plus epsilon Tn, okay? And now, Let's go to this, this is, so remember this guy, it was the lower bound, lower bound on the integral from zero to T of L of SDS. And now this guy, uh, let's basically do our bounds on it. So this is a summation in which, you know, you start N from one and you go to the highest N, to the maximum N, satisfying that TN plus WN is less than or equal to T. So here we sum over all customers such that Tn plus Wn, which is the departure time of the customer, is less than or equal to T. Okay, so we sum at any time, you know, again, T, you know, if you fix a T, uh, this summation means that you count, you, you basically, you, you, you sum the waiting times of all those customers uh, who have departed at a time instant that is less than or equal to T. Now, uh, what we will do is that we will add a further constraint on this summation. I will put that also n is greater than or equal to n0. So this one, it tells you that Tn plus Wn is less than or equal to T. Now this one, you keep the same, 
tf plus w1 is less than or equal to t, but also we put that n is greater than or equal to 0, uh, which means that in this second summation here, the number of terms is less than is less than or equal to the number of terms in the first sum. And we are summing a non-negative quantity. So it means that by eliminating some terms, you know, basically this is less than or equal to that. So again, this, uh, this side here, again, what is its story? It's because it is a lower bound on this quantity, and the, uh, for details, you can refer back to the previous lecture. Uh, and uh, basically, now what we are doing is that we say, okay, let's constrain, the, rather than that starting from n equals 1, you know, let's just start from n equals uh, uh, greater than or equal to n0. So we are basically uh, eliminating terms from this summation, so we are lower bounding, and uh, and then uh, what we have what we have is that uh, tn the tn plus tn plus wn tn plus wn is uh, less than or equal is less than or equal to t, okay. But we know that you know n is n is greater than or equal to n zero, so n is greater than or equal to n zero. So now because n is greater than n is greater than or equal to n zero. Again, from the uh, above limit, again, n0 will be this, this, you know, this, uh, you know, threshold value for the values of small n, such that if you exceed it, then basically wn is less than epsilon tn, which means that tn plus wn is less than 1 plus epsilon 1 plus epsilon tn, okay? And so what we'll do is that uh, we will uh, basically, given now that we have this constraint that n is greater than or equal to n0, then... Uh, by the valid, you know, by basically this limit statement here, I can replace uh, my inequality rather than writing it as tn, uh, tn plus wn is less than or equal to t. I will write it as tn plus epsilon tn is less than or equal to t. And so we can take one uh, tn as a common factor. And now we have, we have basically this. We have uh, a summation. Uh, n is greater than or equal to n0. And now we stop counting, okay, so I can rewrite this thing also as Tn less than or equal to T over 1 plus epsilon. So what we did here is that um, we know, you know, we know basically how to write those sums with in, in terms of the, um, in terms of the arrival, arrival process, okay. Uh, so, uh, okay, maybe I need to highlight this. Uh, so there, there is two counting processes, an arrival process, which is N of T. Now, the arrival process has the advantage of being, uh, of being ordered, right? So, uh, you know, by definition, at the time of arrival of the seventh customer is greater than or equal to the, the time of arrival of the fifth customer. Uh, but uh, the departure process, you know, uh, basically it may be that a TDN you know, uh, uh, you know, it, it may happen that you know the fifth customer will come and will leave the system after actually after the eleventh customer, uh, because you know uh, because maybe the surface time, uh, the surface time, uh, you, you may have more than one server, and it may be basically the case that uh, you know one customer uh, experienced long uh, surface time for some reason. Uh, so, uh, so it it, it it does not have this monotonicity that we have in N of T. So we want to write down our stuff in terms of the arrive the arrival counting process. And uh, this is basically so everything I said here, which is you know why do we why are we interested in W N over A of T N being equal to zero? Uh, we are basically trying to express W N W N as uh, being less than some uh, given constant multiplied by T N so that uh, an event uh, or an inequality involving Tn plus Wn can be written just in terms of Tn, which is the, arri the arrival time instant, okay? So this is Tn. So here we are summing, we are summing from N0, and now we are summing up to the arrival uh, time, satisfying that it is less than or equal to small t over uh, one, uh, plus, 1 plus epsilon. So basically, our uh, our summation here uh, will include will include all arrivals starting from uh, you know n equals n zero up to n equals basically n of uh, t over one plus epsilon, because that's basic that's the maximum uh, arrival time that you allow uh, in your summation. Uh, and uh, this summation here can be written as a summation from one and a summation from 1 to n0 minus 1. Now, uh, 
let's divide by t, divide by t because this is, uh, remember this is the lower bound on this quantity, and then we need to divide by t and take the limit as t goes to infinity, and so we divide by t, and then we investigate, we investigate both terms, and you can convince yourself that basically this second term uh, will, uh, will go to zero. And the reason that this second term will go to zero is that, uh, is that uh, the, number of, the number of terms here is, is finite. Okay, so, so, so you, are, you are summing a finite number, you are summing a finite number, and then you are dividing by t, and you are taking the limit as t goes to infinity. Okay, so you, you take wn, you, again you take wn, and uh, this, you know, and this wn is, um, uh, you know, we have a finite number of them, which is n0 minus 1. But we divide by t, and now t is the parameter, you know, with respect to which we take the limit to infinity. So t can, you know, um, you know, basically, uh, you know, no matter no matter what the sum is equal to. So this summation, you know, can be equal to a very very huge number. Yet, because we divide by t, you can make t even larger, and that's the concept of the limit. And so basically, this will go to zero. Uh, now. Uh, the challenge is that you know what about the first what about the first term? Note that the first term, if you take the limit as t goes to to infinity, we have an n of t here. Okay, so basically the upper limit, you know, we, we cannot say that uh, the upper limit will will remain finite or anything. In, it's the opposite. Basically, uh, as the parameter of n, uh, you know, of inside will go to infinity, uh, n will go to infinity because the arrival process is just accounting. You keep you keep uh, keep you keep track of the arrivals. And it is a non-decreasing, a non-decreasing process. Um, okay, so what, what is what is this limit? So we will do basically what uh, we typically do. So you take the summation, and then you say, okay, so this summation it does not look nice, especially with this um, uh, with this upper bound, upper limit of summation. Uh, but let's divide by the exact same upper limit. Again, the idea here is that by definition, W uh, is uh, the limit as uh, m goes to infinity of k from 1 to m w k over, so this is over m. Okay, and so if you replace this m by something, uh, you are sure will go to infinity almost surely uh, as t goes to infinity, then it's okay. The limit statement will be exactly the same. So, since now we have n of t over 1 plus epsilon opposite, you know, here as the upper limit of summation, uh, to make use of this limit statement, we need to divide by the exact same thing that we have here. Uh, but of course, n of t over 1 plus epsilon, it was not there here. So, you need to have it. Okay. And then you also, in the denominator, you multiply and divide by 1 plus epsilon. So let's see what is going on. So now this summation with this extra term, this will go to that. Now this one will go to lambda. Why it will go to lambda? Because we have, again by definition, lambda is the limit as t goes to infinity of n of t over t. And so replacing t by t over 1 plus epsilon is okay so long as it happens in both the numerator and denominator. And so this will also go to lambda. So now our limit is lambda w. And then we get this, what, what, what may seem, what may seem as an annoying extra factor. Uh, we hoped that basically the, lo you know, the lower bound uh, or a lower bound and the lower bound will converge to um, lambda w, but it converges to lambda w multiplied by 1 over 1 plus 1 plus epsilon. But here is the idea. Is there any restriction on epsilon other than being positive? No. I mean, so, so you choose any epsilon. Okay, so you choose any epsilon, no matter how small, Corresponding to that epsilon, there will be an n0, and so of course n0 is a function of epsilon. Give me an epsilon, there will be a corresponding n0, which is finite. It can be a huge number, but it is finite. 
such that for every small n greater than or equal to n zero, we will get this inequality, which helped us basically um, writing things in terms of, uh, you know, the counting, the arrival counting process and so forth. So, uh, so this is statement here, yes, there is an annoying one plus epsilon, but it is true for every positive epsilon. It is true for every positive epsilon that basically the limit of the lower bound is lower bounded by one plus epsilon over lambda w. So the claim is that the limit is greater than or equal to lambda w. So if you have if you have a quantity gamma that is greater than or equal to one plus epsilon lambda w, and this is true for every epsilon greater than zero, then it must be the case. So this will logically imply that actually gamma is less than or equal to lambda w. And you can prove this by contradiction. So you can show that if you if you assume that big gamma is less than lambda w, there will be a positive value of epsilon that violates this inequality. But this inequality is true for every positive epsilon. So basically our assumption is wrong. So again, the idea is, is uh, uh, suppose that gamma is less than lambda w and drive a contradiction and drive a contradiction. Okay, and so, and so here you, you can encounter like one of those tricks in which like, you know, that are, are not so obvious and so on. So you want to show that the limit is something which is lambda w. Uh, it is, yeah, but, but, but actually being less than one is the problem. Being less than one is the problem because your sandwich theorem requires that, you know, so, so we have an upper, you know, the, the, the upper bound on the quantity of interest goes to lambda w. But this guy, for a fixed epsilon, if you fix epsilon, uh, it will go to, the lower bound will go to something that is lower than lambda w. Okay, so suppose it will go to 0 0.9 lambda w. But then we cannot apply the sandwich theorem. Right, so, so we have an upper bound going to lambda w. We have a lower bound going to 0 0.9 lambda w. So perhaps, perhaps the quantity of interest uh, converges to 0 0.95 lambda w. So that's exactly the point, that, you know, that uh, if this 1 over 1 plus epsilon is less than 1, it will ruin for us, it will ruin for us uh, the sandwich theorem. Uh, but the good news is, that this lower bound, it is true as a lower bound for every positive epsilon. It is this is you know this phrase for every positive epsilon that tells you you know basically this is lambda w. You know you can make this uh, statement without this factor that again for any positive epsilon is less than one, and uh, you can actually put one. So it's it's as if you can put one. As if you can, despite the, despite the fact that this one over one plus epsilon is strictly less than one for any positive epsilon. But you can replace it by one. Again, because it's a statement that is true for every positive epsilon. And again, you know, I wrote it down here. You know, you can, you can do a proof by contradiction and show that, you know, if you don't like this one and, you know, yes, I mean, these things sometimes are hard to swallow. Uh, just, uh, just assume it's opposite and you will find that there is a contradiction. And so it must be true that this statement is true. And so we have a lower bound also going to uh, lambda w. And now you know, we are done. So that's little, uh, that's little slow. Uh, again, fundamental result in queuing theory. And you see here, it's, you know, we, we didn't say exponential or mineralist uh, or any, I mean, basically things here can, in fact, like, you know, there is like an inequality, here, as I said, uh, you know, n, uh, um, n of t, uh, I think, Okay, so this one here, you know, which will actually, uh, you know, allow uh, arrivals at the exact same instant of time and so on. So these are things uh, that are, the, but little, little low is, uh, is basically, uh, it, it's applicable to all those, you know, all those uh, situations that you may think it is not applicable to. Okay, so, 
uh, you know, we talked last time about like the most uh, like basic queuing model, which is MM1. So one server, infinite population, first in, first out, uh, serv service discipline. Uh, but we have exponential, exponential arrivals and exponential, exponential surface time. And so that's the reason why like, it's, it, it, it's like an exercise um, uh, on uh, continuous time Markov chains. Uh, but definitely life is complicated. And there are situations in which like, it's ridiculous to model using the exponential random variable. And so we can take things a step further and say, OK, OK, so let's keep the arrival process memoryless, which means that the inter-arrival times are exponential. Uh, it means that the arrival process is Poisson. Let's keep this one. Let's keep it. But let's now deal with the general surface time. So this is G, G for general, general surface time. And the other, you know, the other parameters are the same, one server, one server and uh, basically an infinite buffer and an infinite population from which we have arrivals and uh, first in, first, uh, uh, first out or first come, first served surface discipline. Okay, now uh, say goodbye to continuous time Markov chains because now the surface time, you know, is not exponential and you can do CTMC once everything can be uh, basically, uh, uh, you, you need to have like, everything exponentially distributed. But now the surface times are general. They can be anything. OK, so what is the idea of studying such systems? Uh, and so you may think, OK, so MG1 like, cannot be modeled using Markov chains. No, it can be. And there is a trick. It's called embedded Markov chain. OK, so embedded Markov chain. And I have seen it written with an E. And I have seen it written with, uh, with an I, Barkov chain, which is, you know, try to study the system at a specific instance of time. <clears throat> and you may be able to construct a Markov chain that captures the dynamics of the system. Okay, so here, you know, basically, uh, <clears throat> things are happening continuous in time, but you will study the system at a specific instance of time. And in the case of MG1, our ancestors discovered that studying the system at times of departure, immediately after departure, is the best way to go. So here we will study the time. What, what is this? We will study the system like state at times. Now, those are discrete times. They are not uniformly spaced. They are not uniform, but this is not a problem. Those are the times of departure. And so let Tn be the time of the nth departure. Okay, and he, he, here is a, a quotient that you know, basically, uh, in littles in littles low derivation, I use the Tn to mean the time of the time of arrival. But now I'm using Tn as time because I, you know, I don't like to have like subscript and superscript. So it's Tn here. In this context, I'm talking Tn is the time of the nth departure. And then An is the number of arrivals during the nth period of service. Uh, not the following, that in, in this, in our system here, uh, arrivals and departures will be ordered uh, because there is just one server. And if our queuing discipline is first in, first out, uh, then basically we cannot have like, you know, the seventh uh, customer uh, being served before the fifth customer. I mean, there is no other server. It's just one server. It's MG1. And during the nth period of service, uh, basically, there will be arrivals while while the server is working with one of the customers. Uh, then there will be arrivals, and let a n be the time of arrivals during the nth period of service. And based on this, we can define a Markov chain, a discrete time Markov chain. Let's see, what is n of t n plus one? 
So this is the number, and, and here again, n is uh, is the number uh, in the system. Okay, it's not arrival, it's not a counter for the arrival process. It is the number of customers in the number of customers in the system. So what is n of t n plus one? Which means that what is the number of customers in the system at t n plus one, which is the time of departure of customer n plus one. Is this something that we can know just by knowing n of t n, which is the number of customers in the system, but at the time of departure of customer n. So the claim is that yes, n of t n plus one, if you know n of t n, you know this guy and you do not need to know anything further in the best. Specifically, suppose that n of t n is equal to zero. So at this time, instant customer n departs and n of t n is equal to zero. It means that when the customer n departs, there was no one waiting in the queue. There was no one waiting in the queue. That's the meaning of n of t n is equal to zero. So what is n of t n plus one? Okay, so let's, let's try to imagine what is going on in this system. So there was an nth customer being served. The nth customer is done. The nth customer will depart from the system. Now the system is empty. We are assuming that n of t n is equal to zero. So basically the server now is idle and you know the, the basically the number of customers in the system remains zero till something happens, which is the arrival. So there will be an arrival. Okay, so so this basically is an arrival. So now what will happen to this arrival, to this arriving customer? This arriving customer will come to an empty system. Okay, so there is no one, no one before this customer and the server is idle. Once this arrival happens, basically, so this will be customer n plus one. So basically server will immediately serve customer n plus one. And this is like sort of an implicit assumption in queuing system that basically if, if, the, if the server is idle and there is a sequester, then basically, you know, there is like, you know, the delay in offering the service is like negligible relative to anything else in the system. So it's, it's like service will start immediately and, you know, what will happen during this surface time? So this guy will, will finish the surface at Tn plus one. At Tn plus one. So during, during this surface, what will happen? There may be other arrivals. And so this, this guy, this customer who comes will depart from the system at Tn plus one and how many customers will be there in the system at the time of departure of customer n plus one? Then t, uh, uh, sorry, big N of t n plus one is exactly equal to the number of arrivals during, during the surface time of customer n plus one. So by definition, this quantity will be a sub n plus one, because we define a n to be the number of arrivals during the nth period of surface. So if the, if after the departure of the nth customer, uh, the number of customers in the system is zero, 
then basically the server becomes idle. It will wait for a new arrival. There is an arrival. This arrival will be arrival n plus one or customer n plus one. This guy will be served. And during the service provided to customer n plus one, there may be a number of arrivals. So those are the arrivals during the service time of customer n plus one, which by definition is a n plus one. And once customer n plus one leaves, the number of customers in the system will be a n plus one. And of course, one of them, one of them, depending on who came first, will be served by the server. And if a n plus one is equal to zero, then the server will be idle. Now, what if n of t n is greater than or equal to one, which means that so we have here another scenario, and this other scenario, n of t n is strictly greater than or equal to one. So customer n is done, and there are still guys in the system. So the server, after serving, after serving customer n, will immediately take one of those guys. We have we have n of t n of them, and will uh, deliver the service. Okay. And again, uh, which one will be, uh, which customer will be served? Uh, the assumption is that uh, first come, first served. Okay. So here. In this situation, surface of customer n plus 1 starts at tn. There will be no delay like this one. Here, here, here the queue is empty, so you need, you need someone to serve. But here, already after customer n, there are still customers in the system. And so basically, and so basically you will have a customer to serve. And this will be... You know, so this guy will, so this is Tn plus 1. Now, what is, what is the number of customers immediately after the departure of customer n plus 1? So after the departure of customer n, there were nt plus 1. nt plus, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 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 n of Tn, n of Tn. After the departure of customer n, there were n of Tn customers. One of them, one of them will immediately be served and will leave the system at Tn plus 1. So that's the minus 1 here. Is this the whole story? No, because there is an arrival process. And so we may, we may have arrivals also during the surface time of customer n plus 1. And so also we will have a n plus 1. So here and there we have a n plus 1. The difference is that if, uh, if you end up uh, you know, after instant TN, there are uh, there are uh, customers. Then one of them will immediately be offered a uh, surface, and then at instant TN plus one, this uh, customer will go away, uh, and um, uh, then the total number now after immediately after the departure of customer N plus one, we will have a N plus one plus N of TN minus one customers. As you can see that given n of tn, which can be 0 or 1 or 2 or 3, you know what is n of tn plus 1. You do not need to know the best. What was going on before uh, n is tn is basically irrelevant in uh, uh, specifying what n of tn plus 1 will be. Okay, so so what we, what we, ha what we did here is a trick. Uh, you have not seen it in, in an exercise or anything, it is something uh, that, you, uh, you know, unless unless you have done it in some other course. Uh, but this is basically the trick of an embedded uh, discrete time Markov chain. So uh, the idea is to think carefully about the system and to choose time instance at which you can define a discrete time Markov chain. Okay, because Markov chains are so powerful. So uh, because the surface time is general here, we cannot make use of the framework of continuous time Markov chains, not a problem. We can basically, we can basically uh, do this embedded Markov chain trick. Okay. Um, we need also like to gain, you know, so okay, so you define this thing here, but 
how can we proceed to analyze, you know, analyze the system and gain, you know, uh, knowledge about, you know, the average number of customers at some time instant, the average waiting time, you know, so basically if, if there is a system that is NG1 and a customer arrives, what on, on average, uh, you know, how many minutes or hours the customer will remain there till the customer is served and so on. So we need to answer these questions. Okay, so um, uh, before doing that, like we, uh, we like prepare the ground for analysis by uh, studying um, uh, basically the quantity a n plus one. So a n plus one is the number of customers who arrive uh, while uh, customer n plus one is being served. And so you know uh, the, the assumption is that the arrival process is a Poisson process, and so it's a random process. And so uh, basically, a n plus one is a is a random variable, and we want to know. Uh, basically it's statistics well the problem is that uh, the number of arrivals will depend on uh, the surface time of customer n plus one uh, the arrival process is a Poisson process with parameter lambda uh, how on average how, you know so basically if you have a Poisson process with parameter lambda on average if you have uh, if you have a, an interval of time duration y how many uh, how many uh, or arrivals on average do uh, you have basically lambda times one but the idea here is that a n plus one is the number of arrivals during during the surface time of the uh, of the n plus one customer and this is a random quantity. so we'll condition on it first so basically the trick here as usual is like something like I traded expectations is like Let's let's assume that the surface time of customer n plus one is uh, y again y units of time seconds minutes hours depending on the situation y units of time and in, if this is true then basically given y uh, the num the average number of arrivals is lambda y and also the second moment will be lambda y plus lambda squared uh, y squared. Okay, so those are basically the parameters of a Poisson random, a Poisson random variable. Uh, but the idea is that y is, uh, uh, you know, y is a realization of a random variable. You know, this random, you know, sometimes it's small, sometimes it's big, according to some distribution, uh, which I will call, so this is the surface time distribution, and our model is that the surface time is general. Okay, so there is some distribution, and, you know, I, I, you know, I, I should leave it general, because I'm studying a Q that is NG1, uh, you know, so basically the idea is, again, I treated expectations, you want this quantity, condition first on y, uh, this is just equal to lambda y, and then average, and the same story for the second moment, okay, so, uh, for example, if you do the, the first moment, uh, you will find that uh, the average number of arrivals during the surface time of customer n plus 1 is lambda, is lambda, multiplied by uh, the average surface time, the expected value of y, which is the average surface time, and, and so this will depend on the exact uh, distribution you uh, use for your surface time. And uh, this product will be called rho. You can do the same thing for the second moment. Uh, you know, the difference will be that here, uh, you know, the, um, the second moment given y uh, is lambda y plus lambda squared y squared, as we know from Poisson processes, and so uh, our result here will depend on the first and second moments of the surface time. Now, suppose that, you know, the system is, you know, stable in the sense that, uh, in the sense that at any instant of time, at any instant of time, uh, you know, uh, there will be a number of customers. Uh, the average is finite. So again, you, you, you are assuming that, you know, things do not grow, uh, grow without bound. Uh, things will grow without bound if lambda is, if lambda is uh, large relative to the average surface time. Uh, uh, then basically, you will have uh, arrivals overwhelming the system. So you have arrivals at a rate uh, that is, uh, you know, at a rate that is much higher than the rate of finishing the surface. Okay, so... No, let, let, let's let's study a, a, a useful situation. A useful situation in which basically uh, the expected number, the expected number of arrivals at a time instant t n, 
is a finite positive number. It can be huge, no problem, but it should not be, it should not be infinite. Now the idea is that we will take this recursion here. Uh, here I am writing it as just one expression. Okay, and so the difference between the two cases is that in one case, in one case we have minus one, in the other case we don't have minus one, so I will just write it with an indicator. And assuming that uh, the expectation of n of tn is, um, uh, is some finite number that exists and again is finite, basically you can take expectation of both sides. And uh, under our assumption, under this assumption, uh, this, uh, after taking the expectation and taking the limit, this will be the limit L, this will be the limit L, and uh, what will be this, what will be this, uh, uh, this expectation? Uh, this expectation will be, uh, so we have expectation that indicator that N of Tn greater than or equal to 1. So uh, this is the expectation of the indicator that the number of customers in the system is one or more, right? And so you can write down this indicator as one minus indicator that the number of customers in the system, you know, immediately after the departure of the nth customer, that this is, so one minus, uh, you know, this indicator. So this indicator, oh, I, I, I should, okay, is equal to zero. This indicator is one minus this indicator, okay? Uh, and so uh, this will give us minus and one, and then you have expectation of indicator that uh, n of tn is equal to zero. So this will give us the probability that n of tn is equal to zero, which is the probability that basically the the q the q is the uh, the q is uh, the, the queuing system is empty, and so this is by zero. And the expectation of this guy is already computed, so it is this quantity rho, which is given by lambda multiplied by the average by the average uh, surface time. And so we will get this result here that by zero is equal to one minus lambda. So this is this is one of the ways. Uh, th there is a way of analyzing the system using probability generating functions, uh, but you know definitely we don't have time for it. But but this is one this is one way, you know one method that you can find in books of queuing theory of how to analyze the MG1 system is basically to uh, write down this uh, this equation uh, describing uh, n of t n plus one uh, uh, in terms of n of t n, then uh, take the expectation of both sides. Uh, then square both sides and take expect, uh, uh, take expectations and then take limits uh, under the assumptions that basically the limits exist. You can make things more rigorous, but again, like we, we don't have time to go into any uh, further details. Okay, so I, I, I need actually to, to speed up a bit. So, uh, so uh, let's assume that the second moment you know, the, the expectation of, uh, you know, n of tn plus 1 squared, that again, if you take the limit, that it exists as a finite, as a finite number, okay, so it is less than, less than infinity, and uh, what you do is that now, you know, different from the previous uh, step, here you will square, you will square, take expectations, and then take the limit, and I will just tell you the final uh, result, the final result is this result here. And uh, this L, this L again, uh, uh, it's, uh, is it, is it basically, uh, is it really the average number of uh, customers in the queue? And uh, yes, it is in our case here, based on the Basta property I talked about in the previous lecture, that if the arrivals, if the arrivals are Poisson, then basically Poisson arrivals uh, see or encounter uh, time averages. Uh, it's a subtlety, uh, and it's not something that is very, uh, like, easy to absorb, but, you know, it is, it is something, I mean, you, because, like, you may wonder, I mean, why are we doing, like, M G one, why not G G one? You know, wh why insisting uh, on basically keeping the arrival process as as uh, a memoryless process, which means Poisson arrival uh, arrivals or uh, exponential inter-arrival times? Uh, well, 
things get much more evil if you remove this assumption. This assumption is needed. You may not be basically uh, like see it clearly, and I will understand this. Uh, but there is a bus stop, uh, basically property being exploited here. And if you use any distribution for uh, for the arrivals other than or uh, for inter arrival times other than the exponential, basically this property will not hold, and actually our analysis here will collapse. Uh, Little slow now, we uh, basically we spent some time to argue that it is much more general than, you know, uh, it, it, you know, than you may expect. And so it is applicable to our situation here, and you can apply it basically to know what is the average delay of the system. Uh, this system, again, as I said, it's, it's better to be uh, studied using the generating function, but, uh, you know, uh, this is just to give you a very, you know, a flavor of, you know, queuing systems. They are, uh, they are very, very useful, and uh, you may basically uh, find yourself using them in uh, in your research. So uh, I, I had like a period. It's it's not in the in the recent past, you know. Before that, I I had a collaborator, and basically he uh, loved to basically write papers, including queues, and so. Uh, you know, uh, you you basically do like a physical layer thing with uh, with queuing. So queues, even queues, like uh, you know, not just for like packets arriving at some node in a network. Uh, queues, like for uh, to model a battery in an energy harvesting system and things like this. You know, uh, as I said, like in the previous lecture, a queue. I, I'm saying customers and saying stuff like this, but actually queues. You know, customers. This word customers can be anything, human and non-human customers. And it can be uh, many things in in real life. So uh, it is a very nice topic, and uh, you know uh, we don't you know we are constrained uh, in time, and so uh, it's it's really bad that that, that we did not like uh, study this uh, topic, uh, give it its you know what uh, what it, it deserves. Okay, so um, you know the the things that we basically we left uh, you know are you know that can be counted in the billions. There are so many important topics that we 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 could not even touch. Okay, so again, so from those you know billion you know or, or billions of topics, uh, there is this topic which I think if I if I offer this course again, uh, you know I will basically uh, make it part of the course. I mean I, I think it deserves to be part of the course. Uh, and uh, it is the topic of sub-Gaussian random variables. And the reason for this is that if you open any book on high dimensional statistics, okay, so open any book on high dimensional statistics, you will find that uh, a chapter near the beginning is on sub-Gaussian random variables. And so it is very important topic and uh, it is sort of a generalization of the Gaussian random variables and it allows you like to basically write down uh, mathematical statements that are not just relevant to Gaussian. They are relevant to this big family that is called sub-Gaussian random variables. And there is another family called sub-exponential, but uh, you know, if you, if you capture, you know, sub-Gaussian random variables and you start playing with them and with their properties, basically, uh, you know, you can easily upgrade to sub-exponential random variables. So, uh, so, what is what is a sub Gaussian random variable? It's a random variable that basically satisfies a certain property. Uh, so uh, it, it can be understood in a number of ways. So uh, you know, recall what is uh, what is the moment generating function the moment generating function of a Gaussian? Okay, so recall MGF of Gaussian uh, zero mean Gaussian. Let's say zero mean Gaussian. Uh, remember what was it? What 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 was the form? It was exponential. Okay, so basically uh, n x of t, which is expectation e to the t x, it was exponential, and then we have like half a t squared sigma squared if it's zero mean. So it is something that is characterized by this, you know, exponential t squared, right? Um, okay, so this is some you know one one important property of Gaussian random variables. So they, they have this moment generating function that like grows exponentially, exponential t squared. 
But something else that is also very nice about uh, Gaussian random variables is basically what about vertil, vertil, uh, uh, basically uh, pro, uh, probability. So basically, uh, you know, for for Gaussian, I mean, we know that you know this tail probability. So the probability that uh, x is greater than or equal to t for Gaussian, you know, that this thing is equal to two, the q function. Okay, so again. Uh, you know, this will be like, uh, if we start here at t, then this will be t over sigma, something like this. And the uh, the q function can be upper bounded by something that is, that depends on the square of this, uh, of this quantity, okay? So basically the tail probability decays as exponential and then you have this minus, minus t squared, okay? So, Basically, the sub-Gaussian family of random variables, you basically um, see, okay, what other random variables, if we upper bound their tail probabilities, we will get something that can be upper bounded by an exponential that, decay, that decays in this particular way. So it's exponential minus a positive constant multiplied by t squared. So those guys, you know, in many cases can be uh, basically uh, analyzed together. Yeah, so rather than, you know, just making your statements just regarding Gaussian random variables, you can, if you have a random variable uh, that shares with the Gaussian random variable this property, that the tail property is upper bounded by something like this, I mean, just uh, make your results general, you know, at least applicable to sub Gaussian random variables. Okay, so it will generalize many of your results, but of course, you know, the, the trick is basically now to, to know what, what are those guys, uh, and uh, if you are dealing with like new random variables, uh, and you want to apply the properties of sub-Gaussian, you need to check that actually uh, the random variables you are dealing with are sub-Gaussian. Okay, so let's be formal. What are, what is a sub-Gaussian random variable? Uh, basically, a sub-Gaussian number has a number of properties, and the cool thing, and I think it's very cool, is that those properties, they double employ one another. So if you check this one, if you check this property here, which is about the, you know, the probability that, that the absolute value of x is greater than or equal to some threshold t. If you check this property for some random variable, and it holds, then your random variable is sub-Gaussian. And all the other properties, 2 and 3 and 4 and 5, are also applicable. So in other words, the, the properties that you find here are equivalent. Each one of them implies the other. Each one of them implies the other. So to show that something is sub-Gaussian, you need just to take one of those properties and verify that your random variable uh, satisfies it, and you are done. So sub-Gaussian random variables, again, if you think about uh, the, the tail probabilities, they decay in this particular form. If you ask about their moments, the bth moment, uh, basically uh, raised to the power 1 over b. So sometimes this is called the LP norm of the random variable. It's upper bounded by square root p. It's upper bounded by square root b. Now this property 1 implies 2, and 2 implies 1. So if, if this is satisfied, this will be satisfied, and vice versa. The sub-Gaussian random variables will also satisfy this, if you take the expectation of e to some, uh, you know, some positive parameter multiplied by x, multiplied by x squared, you will get something that depends on, so you have lambda squared here, you have lambda squared there, and you have this positive constant. Or you have this property, uh, and this property can be used to, to define uh, a norm called the sub-Gaussian norm. Uh, and I actually, like, wrote down, uh, wrote it down, but I mean, as, as you can see, there will be no time to talk about it at all. And then there is this property related to the moment generating function. Okay? 
Uh, so again, the nice thing is that those five statements, the last one, it, it, it's you know, the last one is different from the other four, is that it requires that the the first moment is equal to zero. So uh, it is uh, in the case for zero mean. But so if your stuff is zero mean, you have the five statements. If not zero mean, then at least you have those four statements. They are equivalent. Each statement actually implies the others. And uh, you verify that your random variable is sub-Gaussian by just verifying one of those statements. And it will be a matter of convenience. Sometimes uh, computing uh, basically uh, the LP norm will be the way to go. Sometimes basically this, uh, this state probability is the easiest thing to do. Sometimes computing one of those expectations is more convenient than anything else, and so on and so forth. Okay?